Hello, Pearlside family. Miss you all. Friday night. How you been doing? I did not get abducted by aliens. Um, we just moved our downtown congregation all the way to Kahala. Some of us, we've never been over Red Hill. Uh, there is a place that exists on the east side of the island. And uh, we're right down the street from Kahala Mall. We've been having services for the last three weeks there at Kahala Elementary. And uh, it's been amazing. You know, in John chapter 21, after Jesus' resurrection, it records that his disciples, they were fishing, but they didn't catch anything. And so Jesus cries out to them, hey, have you have any fish? And they're like, no, we don't have any. So Jesus says, throw your net onto the right side of the boat. And then they started to do that, obey Jesus. And then they started to pull that net in. And it records that there was so much fish that they could barely pull in the catch of fish. And that's what we've been seeing. We went more right to the right side of the island, the east side. Uh, by the way, I'm a pro city boy, okay? So you guys thinking, oh, wow, this guy going Kahala. I think he's like, you, you can take the boy out of pro city, but you can't take the pro city out of the boy. All right? Come on, class of 99, Chargers, where you at? <laughs> so I still live here in Ia, and I wave uh, bye to the main campus every Sunday morning as I'm driving out to our Kahala congregation, but it's been amazing just seeing what God has done because of the faithful obedience of, of our church, the leadership, as well as our team moving out there. Um, one of the things, if you ever came to our downtown congregation, we are a older congregation, and it's not a bad thing. We've been seeing a lot of like 50-year-olds, 60-year-olds come to Christ for the first time, get baptized. That's amazing. I'm really happy about that because we are a multi-generational church. We believe God loves all generations and the old has something to give to the young as well as vice versa. The young has something to do to impart to the old as well. But, man, I was looking around our congregation. I'm like, man, we're getting older here. I'm, I'm like one of the youngest guys and I'm pastoring and I'm like 42 years old already, I'm like, we got to get younger. And so it was clear that God was calling us to go to a community and not be in the middle of downtown Honolulu. Because downtown Honolulu, if you ever been there recently on a Sunday, it's a, it's a ghost town. It's pretty dead ever since the pandemic. There were businesses that used to be open on the weekends that now just remain shuttered and closed. And so there's not really much life, not a lot of families. But since we've been there the last three weeks, uh, we've been meeting Chaminade students, McKinley students, uh, you, people from UH been coming, and it's been super exciting. And I, I met this young girl from McKinley High School. She's a freshman. She loved our church so much that the next week she brought her family, her grandma, her cousin. Man, I love it. Her grandma and her cousin, too. They weren't rolling down the street on Vogue's. But, okay, sorry. Sorry, I just had to do that. I just didn't realize I was going to come out. But uh, God is good. God is good, and I'm happy to be back to be able to uh, preach tonight's word. But can we give Pastor Kalai where, oh, there he is. Look, an angel coming in from heaven. <laughs> Pastor Kalai, I'm so glad to be able to do ministry together with uh, ama amazing team of pastors like Pastor Kalai. And, and so you're in good hands with Pastor Kalai. Um, I know, like, we're not supposed to have, like, favorite preachers and because it's all about the word of God and God speaks through his word. You know, it, it can, he can speak through anyone through his word. It's all about his word. But I've said this before publicly. I'll say it again. He's one of my favorite preachers to listen to. This man is so gifted in being able to communicate the word, but just knowing him for so many years, i just seen the character in this man as well. So it's not just lip service, but he lives it. So can we give another hand for his leadership? Thank you for holding down the fort Friday night. And uh, now he's married with a, a wife and, and children, a child, and I'm married with four kids. Uh, just seeing the journey, uh, what God's done in our individual lives, establishing our households. And it's amazing just knowing his background, my background, the households we came from, and the importance of us aligning ourselves to God and his way of doing life, raising a family, loving our spouse, raising our kids, and loving people beyond the walls and the households of our own homes. And that's what this series is about. It's called Relation Shift. And I love it. Every week we've been having our people say it. It's a fun word to say. It's a play on words. And uh, let's all say it together. One, two, three. Relation shift. How many of you are re ready for a relationship tonight in your relationships? 
Come on, I am. Praise God. And we've been looking at the book of Joseph, uh, not the, sorry, the book of Genesis, which talks about in the book of Genesis, there's many chapters dedicated to a man that is named Joseph. And for Joseph, it started off just as a real quick recap um, when we started earlier this month, that God at 17 years old gives Joseph two distinct dreams. That one day he was going to be in this position of authority and leadership over his own family. But because his father favored him, and then we broke that down in week one, we talked about the destructiveness of favoritism. It's destructive because favoritism is divisive. And the reason why it is divisive because it treats love like a commodity. How many of you know that's not how God dispenses his love to this earth? Right? Even while we were sinners, how many of you are grateful that Christ died for us? That we don't have to grovel at God's feet and make amends and get right first to be able to enter into his presence to approach him. But because of what Jesus has done to pay for the penalty of our sins, demonstrating already God's love on the cross over 2,000 years ago, a historical event. So it's not just this religious idea, but it's an actual historical event that happened. It proves that God does not treat us with his love as a commodity. But what favoritism does is that's, what it, that's how it treats love, and that's dangerous. Because it's not, con it's not unconditional at that point when we make people have to earn our love. Like if I have a favorite child because this child is really good at sports or this one's really good at school, then now all the other kids are thinking in my family and household that I have to do these things so that daddy will love me. But that's not our God. And so we can demonstrate God's love through loving everyone with, with the unconditional love, whether or not they can give us anything back. Right, and so that's week one, and so hopefully that's been a blessing so far to your family. And, and then week two, we also continue to talk about, you know, Joseph being in a pit, and what does that mean? His brothers hated him for the dreams and for being the favorite child. He's one of 12. That's a lot of brothers. And so the brothers uh, devised the scheme, threw him in a pit, and he got sold into slavery. And so all of that, one of the, the key takeaways that I just want to remind us is that in the dreams, as the, he shared these dreams to his brother, brothers. They couldn't see past where he currently was. They're like, stupid dream. And I wonder how many times we do that to our loved ones, where they're sharing something, but because we don't look at people with, from where God can bring them, and we just look at people currently where they're at, that we already write off people. We write off their dreams. And so in a household, in a family, how much more so should we be the ones really breathing faith, breathing life into what God has called people to do? And so this is one of the ways that we can pull people out of pits in life. And that's why I love our church. That's what we do every week in our church, whether in our small groups or in our weekend services. We don't look at people where they're at. Oh, how much sin you have walking in here? No, we, we see people, even sin and all, because we know what God can do to transform their life. Can we get an amen? amen? And then last week, oh my gosh, last week was crazy. Because you got the desperate housewife, Mrs. Potiphar, trying to seduce Joseph now. Because Joseph gets sold into slavery, and then he ends up working in Potiphar's house. And he's doing such a great job. And, you know, like he's probably like mopping with his muscles rippling. You know, maybe washing clothes on his six-pack abs. That's probably not a good idea in front of Mrs. Potiphar. So she's like, hmm, you know, I need to have me some of that. And so she tries to make some moves on Joseph. He turns her down. And, and he goes running. And it's crazy because how I see it, like she grabs his clothes. But he's like, no, I'm living for Jesus. And he's like running out like naked running man, Joseph, running away from sin and temptation. And so even when you're being blessed by God and you're doing good things, there's trials, opp oppositions can come. But we need to continue to make that shift in trusting God and being able to focus on God as, as we run away from sin and we run to God. And I think in our families, in our households, sometimes we think our sins doesn't affect our spouse. Like if I watch this that's unclean, that's not good on the computer. It doesn't affect anyone in my household, but we don't realize that it can actually have 
a lot of ramifications to that. But for Joseph, he was an integrous man because he said, how can I do this and sin against, not Potiphar, he says, how can I sin against God? And so because the wife is so upset about this whole situation, here's where we are at with week four of this series relationship. So she's upset. She's so mad. She's like, mm, I want to meet some Joseph, but he said no. So no one gets Joseph. So basically she lies to her husband like, this man tried to rape me. And so Potiphar, I don't know if he believed his wife or not, but he was forced to have to throw Joseph into prison. So Joseph goes from a pit to Potiphar's. Now he's at prison. And in prison, though, the amazing thing, if we were to put ourselves in Joseph's shoes, after everything he's gone through, he is still faithful to God. And that's where we're going to land today. We're going to be talking about how, sometimes in our families we can feel forgotten. We can feel underappreciated, underloved within our own households, with, and whether it's at work or with our friendships. We can feel forgotten, but yet God is still calling us to remain faithful. And how can we do that? And what does that look like? I'm glad you asked because that's what we're going to look at. So Joseph remains faithful, and just like he got promoted at Potiphar's house, uh, where we're going to start off, Joseph has already been promoted to be the head over all the prisoners. Him being a prisoner himself, he is now over all the prisoners. And we're now going to look at Genesis chapter 40. Verse 1, it says, Sometime later, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt offended their master, the king of Egypt. So it doesn't really say what they did here, but I think maybe... You know, Pharaoh went on some diet. Maybe he's on the Atkins diet trying to cut out carbs. And then so the baker probably tried to, like, make some baked goods. And he's like, is this, you know, high in carbs? And the baker's like, what is that? And she's probably all mad, threw him in prison for making him fat and overweight. I don't know. And then it says, verse 2 says, Pharaoh's angry with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker, and put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the same prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard assigned him to Joseph and he attended them. It's amazing. He attended them. In other words, what attended means is he served them. Okay. Joseph is over the prisoners, but yet he didn't use his position of authority to walk around like the alpha, like we, you know, we see modern movies in prison because I've never been to prison. So all I know of prison is what I've seen in the movies. And the alpha, right, like, like him and his gang, it's like you, you clean my converse, right? You go grab my cup of water. That's, that's my cornbread, right? And you just like jack people's stuff. Like that, that's usually when you're the head of the prisoners, that's what you do. But Joseph, he does the exact opposite. He's serving them, and this is how he does it. After they had been in custody for some time, each of the two men, the cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt who were being held in prison, had a dream the same night. And each dream had a meaning of its own. When Joseph came to them the next morning, he saw that they were dejected. So he asked Pharaoh's officials, who were in custody with him in his master's house, why do you look so sad today? We both had dreams, they answered, but there is no one to inter interpret them. Then Joseph said to them, do not interpretations belong to God. Tell me your dreams. Let's go ahead and bow our heads. This is God's word. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for the reading and hearing of your word that brings faith. And we pray, Lord God, for every prison situation that is represented in this room. We pray for the key of faith to unlock, Lord, us to be able to trust you and believe you and see you come through the prison walls. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So some of us, maybe we feel like that. We feel like we've done everything right, like Joseph, but instead of just taking steps forward, every time we take one step forward, it feels like life is pushing us two steps back. And so for Joseph here, 
he starts off his journey with dreams and he could be very bitter. Like the, the, as soon as someone starts talking about dreams, he could have PTSD. Because the, it's the very two dreams that he had that he shared with his brothers that caused him to be in the prison. But yet he recognized these aren't my dreams, these are God's dreams. There's something about the way Joseph lived his life that recognized that God was doing something through all of this. That even though he was forgotten in prison, he remained faithful. And so the first thing is, in our prison, we still have a purpose. And that's really good. Because I've been in those prison moments in my life, whether it's been financial prisons, and I feel like, man, I'm so strapped financially, I feel like I can't do anything. For sometimes it's like, um, you know, I've been married 18 years, and sometimes it's the relational prison. Like my wife and I not talking for days. Don't ask me how long ago that was last weekend. No, just kidding. <laughs> Thank God it wasn't. It was, it was when we first got married, right? We were, we, were, we were so stubborn. We wouldn't forgive each other. And we would just communicate through Morse code by slamming cabinets. Ba ba ba. I love you. No, we were saying something else through slamming those cabinet doors or the fridge door, right? It was very intense. And it's those relational prisons. But even in those moments where we feel like, man, I feel so locked up in this relationship. I feel like I can't do anything. No, with God, when God is with us, because we looked at it last week in Potiphar's house, it clearly says that God was with Joseph. And I, I summarize um, Joseph being elevated in prison as the chief prisoner. And it still says that God is with Joseph. And so when God is with you, no matter where you are at, even in a prison, you still have a purpose. And so what does that purpose look like? Well, let's look at Joseph's life. He could have been either, again, angry at God, angry at the dreams, but yet when they started to share, the, the butler and the baker started to share about the dreams, he was not bitter, but he was going to help them get better because they were all sad. So not only was Joseph not bitter at God or bitter at the dreams, but he was willing to help others. He says, tell me your dreams. And that is amazing to me because he noticed that they were sad. Why do you look so sad today? If I, if I were there, I'm like, because I'm in prison? No, they were, they were troubled. They were sad because they were troubled at the dreams that they had. And it's amazing to me that Joseph had every excuse to be in this depression or self-pity. And I, I'm talking about this because I wonder how many times the prisons that we are in, the walls get thicker because we allow ourselves to get trapped in that very thing of self-pity. Right? When you're in a pit, you're in a prison, you feel like, man, nobody understands what I'm going through. No one has to deal with all this that I have in my family. I probably have the most dysfunctional family out of anyone in here. Like sometimes we feel like that and we start to feel self-pity. There is a theologian that um, we respect or I respect and I like to read on. Uh, he just recently passed away. His name is Timothy Keller. And he says this, that self-pity is the soil which sin then grows. That's scary. Because when you look at the root of what self-pity is, self-pity is rooted in pride. It doesn't look like it necessarily on the surface, but self-pity declares, God, you don't know what you're doing. Why am I in this situation? I deserve better. That's what self-pity is. And the other reason why self-pity is dangerous is because it just causes you to be so tunnel vision that you only are concerned about yourself. And you can look at, right, like you think about a husband and wife coming home. Maybe, or if the, hypothetically, the, the wife maybe is at home all day with the kids. And then the dad had a long day. Maybe the boss berated him. He had extra assignments. He comes home. He's thinking about how I'm so tired. No one understands the stuff I put up with. And then so you come home, and it's just chaos in the house. And, and the, the husband's thinking, man, dinner's not even ready. I feel so underappreciated. And you start to feel bad about yourself. 
But yet, the, the interesting thing is, on the opposite end, the wife could be feeling the exact same way. Right? Home all day with the crazy kids. The, the Cheerios spilled everywhere. How many times stepped on Legos today? I don't even know. Thank God I, I, I still have my feet under me. I didn't have to go and, and get it amputated or something. It's crazy. And then just feeling so stressed out, like all the extra things that the kids did unexpectedly. I didn't even have time to cook, and now I have this pressure to have to finish dinner. And, and so it's just this, this constant, well, me, 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 but it's not even thinking about the other person. So I'm, I don't care about you. I'm just going to take care of myself. And then can you imagine a relationship that just has that mentality? I'm just going to take care of myself. Inevitably, what happens as that continues and it festers and it lingers, people grow distant. People grow apart now. I don't need you. I'm going to take care of myself. But that's not what God created a marriage to be. Marriage is to become one. So, honey, if you're hurting, let me massage your feet. Oh, how many Legos did you step on? Never mind what my boss did to me and how much extra work I had to do. Oh, tell me about your day, love. Right? And you massage your wife's feet. Put that lotion on. Massage it real good. Yes. <laughs> the wife said, amen. That's, that's the magic, man. Massaging the feet. It just, okay, I'll just go on. <laughs> so Joseph here, he wasn't in self-pity. He, he, he was concerned about the other men. And little did he know, and I'm kind of, you know, giving a little spoiler alert. But it was through him asking, tell me about your dreams. Him recognizing something's wrong with these men. I'm in charge of them. So I'm going to serve them. And again, so much of what G Joseph does is a representative or a foreshadowing of what Jesus will do when Jesus comes uh, on the scene later on. Because Jesus is God. He's the son of God and he is God. But he didn't come to be served. Jesus came to serve. That is the ultimate form of leadership. You can, you can read all these great business books on leadership, but that is the ultimate. It's not about having influence and authority, although those things are good and there's ways to use that for, for good. But ultimately, leadership is serving, and that's exactly what Joseph does in this position. And it was through serving, again, this is a little spoiler alert, but that eventually gets him out of prison. But he didn't do it to get himself out of prison. He just did it to serve. Now, I know, I know some of you are thinking, well, if I keep serving, I'm so underappreciated. I feel so used. Like, I've tried that, Pastor. I've tried serving my spouse, but they, they just get worse. They get entitled and they expect more. And I feel like I have nothing else to give. I, I get that. I've, I've been there. And, and I'm not talking about my wife, okay? So don't tell her, oh, you, did you hear the message, Blanca? Your husband is talking some smack about you. <laughs> talking about how you underappreciate him. But, but just in general, in areas of my life where I've given out for the wrong reasons, and I've, I've been miserable, I've been unhappy. But the fact is, when we do it correctly, even scientifically, it shows that those who are helpful end up being more happy. So you remember there's a phrase, and I, I actually first heard Pastor Kalai say this, is that hurt people hurt people, right? Well, here's one for you to remember, or if you're taking notes, you can write it down. Happy people help people. And so when you help others, and you're, it may be because you're not happy right now, but you start helping others, watch what God will do in bringing joy and happiness in your life. And so when we look at scripture, here's the, here's the key to, to serving so that we don't go on serving disgruntled. It says, serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not people. Because you know the Lord will reward each one for whatever good they do, whether they are slave or free. This is really crazy because Joseph is literally a slave in prison. And he was still willing to wholeheartedly serve and be happy because he served these prisoners, not for them, but for God. Because God was with him. So that's one of the ways we can declare with our actions that God is with us by the people we serve. We don't just serve people that we like. 
We don't just serve people that, oh, because they can then give something back to me. Hey, honey, I massaged your feet, so why don't you massage my feet now? Because if that's the expectation and why we're serving, we're going to be unhappy. We're going to eventually feel burnt out or underappreciated because we start to keep tabs now. Man, I, I served this amount, and my spouse or my friend only served me this amount, or I did all this at work, and my boss didn't even recognize half the things I've done. But, man, if we, like Joseph here is in technically kind of like at work, right, because that's what he was doing at prison. He was assigned all the prisoners. But he wasn't doing it for the captain of the prison so that, they, that he could get gold stars and then get an extra popsicle during lunch. He did it because God was with him. He did it for God. And, and I, I remember in my life, you know, all the times, like, I'm tired of serving, but then something in me, the Holy Spirit, reminds me, who are you doing this for? Remember, um, you know, back in the day at Momilani Elementary School Cafeteria where this church started 30 years ago, uh, there's, a, there's the curtains, and behind the curtains, there's the giant projector that we had because it was old tech. It was really huge. Um, and then Pastor Billy likes to reminisce and talk about the actual projection with the, with the slides that you had to, like, pull out. Those are crazy. We should bring that back one day just for fun. And uh, I remember, though, having to always set that up and break that down. And it was already, like, it's like summertime. It's super hot, you know, trying to go zippies with my friends after and getting all sweaty, and I get frustrated. But then every time the Holy Spirit reminds me, who are you doing this for? I'm not doing it for Pastor Norman or for my small group leader that asked me. I'm doing it for you, God. Who are you doing it for? I'm doing it for you, God. Who are you doing it for? I'm doing it for you, God. And then, man, all of a sudden, strength fills me. Joy now becomes my source as I'm doing it for God. I'm remembering I'm doing it for him. And similarly, in our households, when we serve, like, you know, I, taking the kids to school, it can go one of either way for me. It's early in the morning. I'm tired. I'm grouchy. Didn't have coffee yet. By the way, coffee is liquid faith, so it's a good thing. So I didn't have my liquid faith yet, so I'm struggling. You know, kids, like, they took too long to, to get in the car. Now we're catching that traffic jam, trying to get up to Momilani Elementary School. And the, the high school's right there, so there's all the high school students. It's all stressful. And I, I could be just angry, like, oh, i got to take my kids to school. But when I remember, wow, I'm doing this for God. God has given me an opportunity to be able to bless my kids right now, to be able to impart faith instead of frustration. And unfortunately, okay, I'll be honest, it's more times it's frustration than faith. I'm trying. I'm getting better. But the times where I remember I'm doing it for God and not just for my kids, man, the whole atmosphere changes. I'm like, hey, kids, come on, let's pray. What are you believing God today? Instead of, oh, that guy should have turned right already. Why is he still waiting? <laughs> we missed the whole light cycle because of that guy. <laughs> and my kids are listening to this. And, and it, it scares me because sometimes now it comes out of their mouth before I say it. I'm like, oh, I ruined them. Thank God for youth ministry. We got good youth leaders. Get them straight. Get them right. Send them to Freedom Weekend. <laughs> Praise God. But we got to remember who we're doing it for. I mean, even scientifically, Time Magazine even specifically says that when we serve others, it's, it's likened and similar to the endorphins that happen when we eat food or we have sex, that there's the same kind of chemical releases. Why? Because God created us. And God created us for good works. So even when we're in a prison, that doesn't stop who we are. Amen? And so I don't know what kind of prison you're in right now. Maybe you feel like you're in some kind of health issue. And, and I get it. Like if you're going through rehab on stuff or chemotherapy, that's very intense. Right? Um, if you have to go to dialysis. But one of the people I think about on that is Jen. And um, there's, this, there's this leader that is in our church. Uh, she's not living here right now. But Jen had a kidney transplant. But even through all that, she continued to serve this church with such joy. It's crazy watching her go. And nothing could stop her. So she didn't let her medical condition become a prison to stop her from God's purpose. Amen. 
And so I want to encourage us that maybe you feel unloved or you, you feel like, man, I'm stuck with a bunch of inmates in my house or a bunch of inmates at my workplace. But remember who we're serving. We are serving God. But here's the amazing thing. It doesn't stop there. There's more that Joseph shows us. So as these men start to tell the dreams to Joseph, before that, Joseph says to them, do not interpretations belong to God. So one of the key takeaways is that we too need to learn to interpret our situation from God's vantage point. Because oftentimes from our earthly perspective, right, we think A plus B equals C. Like there should be some kind of progression. Like it's linear, like how we feel, right? If I, if I did good in my last season, I should reap good in my next season. And yes, that oftentimes is the case that God rewards those who faithfully seek after them so we can expect that. But yet we don't know when that's going to happen. That's the thing. And we don't know what is going to come in between that from happening. So these dreams that God gave Joseph from the beginning... God doesn't show him in those dreams all that he has to go through to be able to see the fruition, the realization, and the actualization of these dreams. And sometimes in our lives, like, we don't get why we're going through stuff. But we need to allow the correct interpretation of what we are experiencing. Because oftentimes, we let other people dictate the interpretation. Or we let our own feelings and emotions dictate the interpretation. So I can speak some Cantonese. I, it was actually my first language. Uh, I was born and raised here, but then my grandma, who's from Hong Kong, raised me, okay? So when I went to preschool, actually, I, I had to, um, they almost kicked me out of preschool because I couldn't speak English. So I can still speak some Cantonese, and my friends like bringing me to eat dim sum. How many of you guys love dim sum in here? All right. Yeah, I love dim sum too, and so I remember one time I was going out to eat with my friends dim sum, and they had me order. Um, that, that restaurant didn't have, like, the pictures. It's so easy. I want two of this, three of these. Like, thank God for the pictures now. You just point, you know. But that restaurant didn't have pictures. So I was the translator for my friends. And, and the crazy thing is that the lady, you know, Cantonese can be very harsh sounding. So she was, like, asking us, like, do we need anything else? Do we need more tea? But then to my friends that I was eating with, they were like, they were like kind of shocked at that lady in the way. She, and then after she left, they asked me, did we do something wrong? I'm like, what? Why, why do you ask that? Because it sounds like she's really mad at us. Is she mad at us? What did we do to offend her? I was like, oh, no, no, no. It's the opposite. She's actually super nice. <laughs> she's actually was trying to take care of us and making sure we had enough to eat and that we had enough tea. They're like, what? That really? I was like, yeah, because they didn't understand. They didn't have the interpretation right. And so in our lives, sometimes when we're going through stuff, we get it all twisted, right? When we look at stuff, we're like, man, God, he doesn't love me. God, he doesn't care about me. But we need to interpret life situations not by what other people say but what God says. And thank God we have his holy word, amen? The whole book of the Bible is perfect, and because it's perfect, we always have the perfect view of God. And sometimes it takes a while, though. It's not like we can just immediately, like, whoo, like um, the Apple iVision Pro goggles, whatever it's called. And it also we could see everything. But when we grow in the word, we will grow in our ability to interpret what God is doing through events. And so even when we're in a prison, it shouldn't be like, God. Like I used to pray this, right, when I was uh, spiritually just growing in faith. God, get me out of this situation. And that's okay, prayer to pray still, okay? But, but if we're leaving out the next part, we're totally missing out what God can do. God, what are you trying to teach me in this prison moment right now? Because oftentimes that's what God is doing in using these prison moments is to refine us and develop us. So that when it is proper time for us to receive the gift that God has for us, we can then handle the gift in a proper way, like Joseph waiting for the fulfillment of that vision. So this is what scripture says as we interpret what is going on in our lives. John 16, Jesus specifically says, 
in the world you will have tribulation. But, I love when there's a but in the Bible, it's so good because it helps us see God's vision, God's interpretation of what's happening. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So it may feel like in our prisons, the world is falling apart, that we are trapped. But God knows this. He sees every prison situation represented in this room right now. Even before we even pray it, he already knows. He sees it all. And that's what he's warning us is that don't be surprised when you do end up in a trial. Because one, we're not perfect. So sometimes we just got to take ownership. We're the ones that deserve to be in that prison. We got us in that situation. We got ourselves in that. But also, we live in a fallen world where other people are not perfect. Our family members are not perfect. Here's the truth. There is no functional family. Every family is dysfunctional. That's why we all need Jesus. And because of that, there's other people through their actions, like Joseph, that's exactly what happened to him Even though he did everything right in Potiphar's house, didn't sleep with Potiphar's wife, still ends up in prison. But he's interpreting, he's continuing to interpret things through God's interpretation. Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 says this, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. This is really important. Sometimes in our prisons, we feel like, man, I'm, I'm not good enough. Man, I'm not smart enough. Man, I'm not worthy. And all those things actually without Christ is true. That is true. And the sooner we recognize those things, the sooner, uh, the better we'll be for it. Because then we will recognize our need for Jesus. Our need for our Savior. We realize we're not just adding Jesus into our life but we're giving Jesus our whole life. I'm not able to do this on my own. But here's the good news. Other people may say that now that you're in this prison, you're always going to be like this. Other people may interpret and say, wow, you messed up so bad, you're not going to get out of this. Other people might look at what you've done and say, you're stuck here. But we know what God's vantage point is and what God's interpretation is that While other people saying you're finished, God's saying I'm not finished. I'm just getting started. And and so God still is working inside of our lives until Jesus returns. So until that day we either meet Jesus or Jesus comes and meets us, God is still working inside of us. Amen. Well, Joseph then um, hears the dreams, and it's pretty wild. You can go back for the sake of time. I'm not going to read it. The dreams are crazy. And, and Joseph interprets it to a T. So, so for the um, cupbearer, he, he's saying, Pharaoh's going to restore you in three days, and you're going to have that position. And you're like, man, what is a cupbearer? Cupbearer is not a, the best job, okay, to have. You better have good life insurance policy because what you're doing as a cupbearer, people would try to poison the king. So the cupbearer would have to taste the, the, the wine or the drink first to make sure it's not poison. And you know how he'll find out it's poison? If he lives or dies. So that's a pretty rough job. But anyways, the, the cupbearer gets restored and then the baker's like, ooh, me next. Interpret my dream. And, and as, as Joseph's hearing this dream, he's like, uh-huh, go on. And you can see Joseph's face probably go like, mm. So basically, same, similarly, three days later, he gets taken out of prison. But instead of getting restored to his position, he gets beheaded. And then you just got to read the dream. It's wild. There's birds involved and pecking and, yeah, I'll just leave it there. But, but here's the thing. For Joseph, he tells the cupbearer that when you get released, remember me. All right? But what does scripture say? So sad. Verse 23 says, the chief cupbearer, however, did not remember Joseph. He forgot him. Man, like, I know. I know the the cupbearer was probably super excited that he got released. It probably felt like winning the lottery. But how are you going to forget your boy? Like, that's messed up. Like, he interpreted your dream. It was just three days later. It came true. Where's the gratitude? Where's the love at? And you know what that resulted in? Two more years of imprisonment for Joseph. A place that he shouldn't even have been to begin with. And they forgot Joseph. 
So here's the good news. Even when others forget us, believe that God is always with us. Let's go back to Genesis 39, verse 20 to 23. This is as Joseph was getting promoted in prison. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those he held in the prison and was made to be responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. This is amazing. Even when other people forget us and how that might look like in our daily lives, is maybe it's a lack of appreciation. Maybe in our families or at work or with our friends, in our relationships, we feel like we do everything and we never get a thank you. We feel forgotten. But we got to remember that when God is with us, that we can still have success. Even without the love and the recognition or the accolades or anyone returning anything back to us, we too can still have success. In other words, if I'm going to be a prisoner, I'm going to be the best prisoner I can be because God is with me. As a husband, even if my, my kids don't appreciate what I do, maybe my wife is just doing stuff I don't even know what she's doing, I'm going to be the best husband I can be. Because why? Because God is with me. And when we recognize God is with us, we are never alone. We are never forsaken. We are never forgotten. Well, here's the amazing thing. Two years later, Pharaoh himself starts having these crazy dreams about cows and zombie cows. And, and the, the, the healthy cows get eaten by zombie cows. It's like night of the living dead, um, but cow version. Okay. And, and so Pharaoh's like super bothered. And, and this is Egypt, by the way. So they, they are really in tune with science and, and the interpretation of dreams. But yet all the best books, like, you know, just going through every book at Barnes and & Nobles and searching chat GPT, there's nothing that told, jo that told Pharaoh what those dreams meant. And so finally the cupbearer is like, oh, my gosh, that's right. My boy Joseph, my dog from the pen from cell block nine. He finally remembered after two years. Better late than never, I guess. So he tells, he tells Pharaoh about this guy that claims he can interpret dreams and it actually worked for him. And that's why he's restored. And so as we look at Genesis chapter 41, this is where we're at now. Verse 14 to 16 says, so Pharaoh sent for Joseph and he was quickly brought from the dungeon when he had shaved and changed his clothes, he came before Pharaoh. Pharaoh said to Joseph, I had a dream and no one can interpret it. But I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. This is gangster right here. I love this. Verse 16. You, after everything Joseph went through, you know, going from being a, a sold as a slave being accused of rape, being a prisoner longer than he should have. He should have even been in jail. You think at this time, you're like, yeah, I, I'm, I got this. You know, I'm the man. I can do this on my own. Pharaoh is saying, you can interpret dreams. Can you do this? What does Joseph say? He says, I cannot do it. Like, that is a bold statement. Because what if Pharaoh's like, oh, you cannot? Okay, back to jail then. But he says, I cannot do it. Joseph replied to Pharaoh, but God will give Pharaoh the answer he desires. Joseph is so consistent. Even when forgotten, he is still faithful to God. He's still giving God glory. He's still giving God credit. It's all about what God has done. And he's not bitter at God, but he continues to lift up God. Why is that? Because our prison is to prepare us for the palace, and that's the place of promotion. 1 Peter chapter 5 sums it up well. It says, so humble yourselves under the mighty power of God, and at the right time, he will lift you up in honor. Give all your worries and cares to God, for God cares about you. He cares about you. So it's God that will promote. Sometimes we are the ones like, man, I've been in jail long enough. 
Like, what, what do I got to do to get out of this prison? Well, as long as we continue to be faithful to God, because God is faithful to us. And this is what faith looks like, okay? Faith is not just receiving the dream. And faith is not just then seeing the fulfillment of the dream. What real faith looks like is everything between that point A and point B. This is what faith looks like. That even though I've been accused of wrong things, I've been mistreated by my family, even though I've been forgotten in prison, I am still going to have faith in God. I'm still going to believe in God. I'm still going to worship God. I'm still going to praise God and bless God. That's what faith looks like. That's what humility looks like. It's not this self-entitlement or self-pity. I deserve better. I deserve more. But God, thank you. Thank you for what you've done in my life. And even though I am hurting, we can be honest, even though I'm hurting in this prison, God, I'm going to continue to trust you. I'm going to continue to bless you because you've already blessed me. I mean, for Joseph, Jesus didn't even come yet and die for him. So Joseph didn't even have the interpretation of the, the Bible that we have. Joseph doesn't have the Holy Spirit to guide us in our prayers and to direct our steps to be our helper and our friend. So how much more so, no matter what prison we are locked up in today, would God not be able to penetrate those walls? Because that's exactly what Jesus did as his disciples were scared and they locked themselves up. Jesus walked right through that wall. And so as we close, we're going to believe that as you continue to humble yourself and you trust in God, and that through that you can continue to serve others with joy because you're not really serving them, but even in a prison, you have a purpose because you're serving God. That in due time, God will bring you from the prison to the palace. Amen. I'm going to close with a story about a Christian artist named Jeremy Camp. Uh, but before he got his promotion to selling 4.5 million records and having 37 number one hits, he was in a pit and a prison himself. He was a young man who had a difficult childhood and things did not get easier. Because early in his music career, Jeremy fell in love with a woman named Melissa who was diagnosed with cancer shortly after they started dating. And despite her illness, they married, believing God will see them through. Tragically, just months after the wedding, Melissa passed away. And Jeremy was devastated and questioned why God would allow him to experience such pain. His and Melissa's story is portrayed in the movie, I Still Believe. And this movie came out a few years ago, but we're just going to watch the trailer to, to see the encapsulation of this journey. My name is Jeremy Camp. I want to introduce you guys to someone special tonight. This is my fiance, Melissa. Go ahead and stand up, babe. <laughs> Come on, stand up. I know, I'm taken, I'm sorry. Earlier this year, we had some tough news. Some really tough news. Can we do something special for the most special person in my life tonight? Can we pray for her? Heal her tonight. Now we have an artist who's had 32 number one singles, 4.5 million albums sold. Let's welcome Jeremy Camp. I still believe you're getting married. Yeah. But will she get better? I don't know, Mom. Son, you're only 20 years old. You just met this girl. I'm supposed to be with her. I can't explain it. I just know that. Even when I don't see. I want you to know that whatever this is <laughs> and wherever it takes us, that I'm with you. Every step, every moment, I'm with you. I'm in. I'm so in. The only place I can go is into your arms. I will love you, cherish you, every moment of every day. I'll be the love of your life and your biggest fan. I still believe in your holy word. What if this was my destiny? Stop. You were the strong one, not me. All I have are questions. What am I supposed to do with that? I still believe. I still believe. I keep 
thinking, if one person's life is changed by what I go through, it will all be worth it. So for Melissa, the prison that she was in is cancer, and the promotion that she got was to be able to spend eternity with Jesus. Because when we really understand what it means to be face-to-face -face with God and how amazing heaven is compared to anything we can ever experience in this earth, all the joys combined does not compare at all to what we will experience in the afterlife with Christ. And so for her, she got promoted to be with Jesus for Jeremy, though, he was in a prison of pain for years and had to wrestle with that. But through it, he found a deeper faith. Through it, he realized he can now connect better with those who are grieving, who those who have suffered greater loss. Through it, he was then able to write deeper songs and hence the um, millions of records sold and the 37 number one hits that all came from his prison. God was able to use it as, as Jeremy wrestled with God and trusted God and still believed in God to be promoted into where he's at today. So I want to encourage us with the words of what he says here. This is a direct quote from Jeremy Camp. There is a bigger picture. God's plan is better than anything I could ever think of, and that's what I hold on to. So right now, some of us, we're gripped. Right now, we're holding on to the bars of what we're locked into. Now we feel like this is all there is. But let's hold on to, like Joseph, knowing, okay, God gave me a dream. It's going to get better. And even if I don't see it on this side of life, I know that God is better than everything. But we also believe in breakthrough in this church. We've seen people healed of cancer. We've seen divorced couples come back together. We've seen people reconciled where there is no way it should be reconciled between parent and child, whatever situation it may be. Jesus is able to walk through every prison wall. Amen. Let's go ahead and bow our heads as we pray. Father God, we thank you, Lord, that you are good. And even though our pit or our prison may seem bad, we thank you, Lord God. It doesn't change the fact that you are good. And so we pray right now, Lord, no matter what kind of prison we feel locked up in, may you come and walk through those walls and help us to know, Lord God, that we are not alone. I pray for those right now that feel abandoned, feel unloved, feel isolated. But we thank you, Lord God, that this is just part of your plan and what you're doing you're not the author of evil, but you can use the worst situations to allow your goodness to be seen, to allow your goodness to be recognized. And so we pray, Lord God, that you would turn every bad situation and fill it with your good right now.